Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, inviting you, as always, to grab your copy of God's Word and open it to Psalm 107. And while you do, Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, is here to update us on the travels of our world prayer team. So, hi, Greg. Hey, Steve. Now, we're going to a fascinating part of the world this week. I venture to say it's an area where a lot of people have not been. <laughs> yes. Uh, it feels very different. Where is that place? Well, as a prayer team this whole week, we're traveling through Russia and the Commonwealth of Independent States. That includes the country we're going to talk about today, which is the country of Tajikistan. Yes. And not, I would, not a big tourist destination. I would know it's not, and I would venture to say many people would struggle to find it on a map or yeah. on Google Maps, and that's okay. It's The world is a big place, and one of the things we like to do is educate ourselves together about what's going on in this world that God has made and that God has called us to reach. Now, 93% of the Tajik people claim Islam as their religion, yeah. and yet few have actually had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Missiologists say that about 61% are unreached. And yet, despite all of this, and we love to always tell the story this way, even in the hard places, a Tajik church is rising. Yeah. Now, what do you think it's like for Christians in Tajikistan? It is really tough. In fact, I would venture to say uh, we would have difficulty even imagining or mm. entering into such a highly restrictive, uh, highly suspicious environment. They are subject to uh, surveillance Government authorities heavily monitor ministry activities. Hmm. Um, each year, more and more legislation is being passed that restricts Christian freedoms. Churches are being raided and fined. Members are arrested and interrogated. And those who turn to Christ from Islam face persecution from authorities, from neighbors, family. You really can get to a point of what feels like paranoia when you live yeah. in an environment like that. And so imagine trying to follow Christ and how hungry you would be to yeah. be taught the word of God when you're in that kind of a tough spot. Yeah. How can we pray for through the Bible specifically in Tajikistan and for that matter, all of the other stands that are there in the surrounding region? Well, first of all, pray that the doors of broadcasting would remain open. Uh, we never take for granted that we have the privilege of broadcasting into some of these far flung places. And mm -hmm. and the, the transmitter that it goes off of is so secret that our partner won't even tell me where it is. I have wow. a general idea of where it is because it's so sensitive. So pray that we'd be able to keep broadcasting. Pray that we would reach into the hearts of listeners who are being persecuted and that we will strengthen them. Because yeah. persecuted Christians almost universally ask for more prayer. Mm -hmm. They don't ask for being relieved of their pains yeah. and trials and pressures, but they say, please pray for us. Yeah. And even with all of that persecution, all of that government intervention, we're still seeing fruit come yeah. out of that it's part a, of the world. It's amazing. It, it is so encouraging. Here's the letter that we got. The programs are especially interesting for Christians like me who cannot go to a church. I am from a Muslim background and suffer persecution at the hands of my family because of my new faith. Your broadcasts are interesting, understandable, and biblically sound. This comes from a guy who was a Muslim who yes. could say our, our, our <laughs> yes, studies are I biblically that. sound. That's wonderful. They address the challenges I face in my life, and I am grateful to be able to listen to them in secret. Now, here's another one. Although our country is praised as modern and a developed people, women have a hard life. Hmm. We are discriminated against, and many treat us as worthless. This is why I'm not surprised that many of us are turning to Christ. Amen hmm. to that. We feel the only place we belong is with Jesus. He sees our worth even when no one else does. Well, if you're encouraged by these letters and you'd like to pray specifically for wherever our world prayer team is praying on a particular day, why don't you join our world prayer team by going to ttb.org forward slash pray. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we open our study? Father, our hearts are deeply touched at the plight of fellow believers and fellow human beings in places in the earth where it's such a hard place to even choose to follow Jesus. And we pray that you would help us reach into those places, encourage those believers. And we pray you'll strengthen us now in our own walk with you as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come today to one of the great psalms of the Scripture. It's the 107th Psalm. It has been greatly misunderstood. I feel like even a wonderful commentator like Matthew Henry, who has so many wonderful things to say about the psalm, missed it because of the fact that he did not see the prophetic at all. 
And I trust by now that many of you are seeing that there is a deep meaning in these psalms, and that when you put them back in their proper context, there flashes out for us today a new meaning that will be helpful to us. And I'm going to emphasize that because today it has a special meaning because it opens like this, "'O give thanks unto the Lord, for he's good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy.'" Now, friends, we need more say-so Christian. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Don't go around and complain and criticize if you're a Christian. Tell how good God is, because he is good. Now, he doesn't have a good name in this world. You know, God's reputation is bad. Now, reputation remembers what people think about you. God does not have a friend at court among the multitudes of this world. No defender no champion, no ally to testify on his behalf. There's no one to take the witness stand and say a good word for God today. Now, if you doubt that, look about you. The pagan and heathen religions, their conception of God is terrifying. And he's a God that would destroy and not save and difficult to get to, by the way, and not interested in us at all, nor does he love us. The average person in this land with a veneer of civilization, a modicum of education, with a little Christian culture smeared on like cold cream, and to them, God is not a person to cultivate. We keep him at arm's length. He's not really a good neighbor. He's very difficult to please. He's like the average conception of a policeman, that he's waiting around the corner to find fault with us. He's not a friend at all. A little girl, I think, gave the average conception of God when she gave a verse of Scripture and got it a little confused. And this is the way she gave it. If God be for you, you're up against it. Well, that's the way a great many people think of him. Now, if anyone is going to say that God is good, the redeemed are going to have to say so. God is good. And that's not an axiom. It's a proposition that is subject to proof. It's not a cliché. It's not a slogan. It's not propaganda. It is true. It's a great truth. Now, this is a Psalm 107 that I've set it to music, and I'm no musician at all. I think you have four stanzas here, and if you'll notice that mechanically the psalm divides itself like that. At verse 8, you have the chorus. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. Then you move down to verse 21, and that's repeated. You go down to verse 31, it's repeated again. So that we have three times in this psalm this chorus, and it divides the psalm. In the first seven verses, you have the providence of God. Here's where he directs pilgrims, and I would make this a tenor solo. Then in verses 8 through 20, you have the pardon of God, and here he delivers prisoners. And I would say this is a soprano solo. Then in verses 21 to 30, you have the protection of God, and here's where he dissolves problems. This is a bass solo. And then in verses 31 to 43, the rest of the psalm, you have the power of God. And here's where he delights his people. And then I think we ought to all come back and sing the chorus again. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good. His mercy endureth forever. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, he goes on here and he says... And he's gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Israel. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to the city of habitation. This is a new section 
that we've come to in the book of Psalms. It's the last of the Pentateuch that corresponds to the Pentateuch of Moses. This is the Deuteronomy section, and the emphasis here will be upon the Word of God. Now, back in Deuteronomy, God had already said that these people would be scattered because of their sin. Deuteronomy 28, 64 and 65, "...and the Lord God shall scatter thee among all people." from the end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shalt have the sole of thy foot find rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, failing eyes and sorrow of mine. Now that's been the picture of these people down through the ages when they disobeyed God out of the land. But God, by His providence, is going to gather them back into that land. He intends to make good His promise to them. This is a wonderful picture and a glorious picture of the providence of God in the lives of these people. But it speaks of me. He reached out there in the wilderness of this world, saved me, and I'm sure that's what He did for you. This is a glorious, wonderful picture, friends, of the providence of God In the lives of these people, God is not through with the nation Israel. And thank God He's not through with you, and He's not through with me today. This has a message for us. Now we come to the second section here of this very wonderful 107th Psalm, and we have here pardon, the pardon of God. Here's where He delivers prisoners. And as we've said, we'd make this a soprano solo Now, will you notice several verses in this section? It begins on that high note of praise. In other words, they have the chorus here at the beginning rather than at the end of the section. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. Now, we move down in the psalm, and you'll notice that he delivers prisoners. And we have here a picture of a man in prison. And it's a picture of these people in the time of trouble that is coming. And a man in prison in that day, God will deliver him and bring him back into that land. Friends, think of the multitudes that were in prisons yonder in Germany, and they never got out. I wonder how many of them at that time thought of this psalm and turned to this psalm here. Now, verse 10 says, "...such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron." And then verse 14, "...he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands in sunder." And then verse 16, "...for he hath broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in sunder." You remember how he brought Simon Peter out of prison, how he delivered Paul and Silas at night, and how today he's delivered you and me. You and I were in the prison house of sin, and God has given us a pardon. We have a pardon, and we're delivered from that. But a pardon is for everybody today. There's a pardon for you. I do not know who you are, but there's a pardon. Well, somebody then says, "'Why am I not forgiven?' Well, even in prison today, a pardon must be accepted. I heard of a case back in Pennsylvania. I heard Dr. Harry Rimmer tell about it. This man was granted a pardon by the governor, and he wouldn't accept it. And the prison authorities, including the warden, they were all in a dilemma. What do you do with a man that's got a pardon, and he won't accept it? And the answer was, finally, they appealed to the judge on it, He said, he'll have to stay in prison. You have to accept a pardon for it to be valid. Now, the Lord has a pardon for you. In the Lord Jesus, we have forgiveness of sin, pardon for our iniquity, but you have to accept it. And by the way, have you accepted your pardon today, delivered from sin and from the penalty of sin? This is a marvelous picture that you have here, but think what it's going to mean to those people in the day that yet future, when many of them are in prison, and God will deliver them out of prison and bring them into that land. 
Now, there's so much that's wonderful in this section, but we can't take too much time to look at it. Now we come to this next here, which is protection. Here's where God dissolves the problems. And I've made this a bass solo. And again, it opens with that same chorus, Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. And then it begins here, Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And today, that's the kind of offering God wants you and me to bring to him, is that same kind of offering. And that is that we come to him bringing the sacrifice of praise to him. That is what he wants from us, and we are to offer that kind of a sacrifice to him today. Come bringing to him sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving unto him. And as a result, we have an altar, whereof they that have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin to burn without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate, let us go forth therefore unto him, Without the camp bearing his reproach, for here we have no continuing city. We seek one to come, but by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And you don't have to wait till you get to church to give to him a sacrifice, and that is the fruit of your lips. Praise unto God. And what for? For his protection. Has he brought you up to this present hour? Now, will you notice this section here, verse 23? They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. This matter of being a sailor in the days of the sailing vessel, it was dangerous business man that went on a voyage didn't know whether he was coming back or not. Couldn't be sure of that. And therefore, in that day, they could commit themselves more to God, I think, than people do today. They don't think anything at all about getting board a great ship or a plane even today. They give no thought to it at all because of the fact that most adopt a philosophy of fatalism, that if it's going to happen, you can't do anything about it. Well, it's wonderful to be able to commit ourselves to God at a time like that. Then in verse 31, we come now to the last stanza here. And here we see the power of God where he delights his people. And here is the way that it begins. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of man. Now, this is a chorus. All of us can join in this here because we need power in our lives for living today. I think that's probably something that most of us need. It was said of Thomas Aquinas. One day he walked into where the Pope was counting the money of the church. Pope looked up and saw Thomas Aquinas and said to him, Sir Thomas said, No longer can the church say to the impotent man, Silver and gold have I none. And Thomas Aquinas wheeled and started out And with not even turning back, he said, That is right, sir. And no longer can the church say to the impotent man, Rise and walk. Today we are problem conscious, and we are not power conscious, as someone has said. Now, the early church was conscious of the power of God. I think of the church today, in fact, all Christian works, probably including this broadcast, by the way, Many years ago, the Standard Oil Company had a float in the Rose Parade here in Pasadena. And it was one of the first parades I think I saw. And that Standard Oil float was a beautiful float. I never shall forget it. Beautiful American Beauty roses, the like of which I had never seen before. And right in the middle of the parade, why, that Standard Oil Company float ran out of gas and had to be towed. 
may I say to you, everybody laughed when they heard about it. And of course they did. You know, the last float in that parade that should have run out of gas was the Standard Oil Company float. They should have had gas and had enough of it to make the parade. But somebody had forgotten to fill up the tank, and there they were. And I looked at that poor helpless float there as it stopped right almost in front of us, and everybody was laughing. I felt sorry because I said, that's a picture of the church. We're beautiful. We've all decorated out with our buildings today and our programs and our service and our propaganda. But there's no power, no power at all. That's what we need today. And I think one of the reasons is we're not praising him as we should. Verse 32, let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. We need today to praise God. And praise goes before power, my beloved. It is what puts the gas in the tank. It is that which gets the rocket ready to take off out yonder. And this is the picture that's given to us here. And I conclude this section with verse 43. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Now, loving kindness, you remember, the little girl defined what loving kindness was and the difference between just kindness and loving kindness. She said, if you go in and ask your mama for a piece of bread and butter and she gives it to you, that's kindness. But if she puts jam on it without you asking her, that's loving kindness. My friend, the loving kindness of God is wonderful toward us today. And what a picture, what a glorious picture this is for us. Now, the next two psalms that we have here, Psalm 108 and Psalm 109. Psalm 108, if you'll note, is a psalm of David. It's a very wonderful psalm. I don't want to spend too much time with it. It has caused, of course, much criticism. Some think that it's a patchwork. It's not that at all. But it's a great psalm. And let me emphasize here, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. This is Israel's remnant, redeemed, brought home, praising and exalting the Lord. We saw in the last psalm, God was going to bring them back into the land and he brought them from everywhere. Now they're back in the land and they're praising God and glorifying him. And verse 7, God hath spoken in his holiness, and I will rejoice. Then he talks about dividing the land there and how the land will be divided in that day. It's a glorious, wonderful psalm. We'll not spend any more time with it, however. Now in Psalm 109, you have the humiliation actually of Christ. It's a messianic psalm. And the next psalm, Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. Now, these two psalms that we have here, messianic psalms, one, the humiliation of Christ, and the other, the exaltation of Christ. And I would just like to lift out of it, we find here that in the eighth verse, is quoted in the first chapter of the book of Acts, and it's applied to Judas Iscariot. By the way, let me read this. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. That would indicate that Judas was married, also that he had no children, by the way. And if he did have any, they'd be wanderers and vague. Then in Psalm 110, we have actually the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here you have... Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies as footstool of thy feet. This is a psalm. It's a great psalm. And again, you find this in the second chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. By the way, I see that our time is about up. And I'm going to have to break off in this psalm. I would like to pick it up next time. It's a very brief psalm but it is one that is quoted so often 
and it refers to the order of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the order of Melchizedek. And that, of course, is what the writer to the Hebrews emphasizes, that the priesthood of the Lord Jesus is superior to that of the Old Testament, that is, of the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. And so we'll have to reserve that until next time. We'll spend more time in Psalms 109 and 110 on Monday, so be sure to meet us back here. And then join me for Dr. McGee's Sunday sermon titled, Faith and Freedom and the Foundation. To listen online or to see if your station carries the Sunday sermon, visit us at ttb.org. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, praying that you find great encouragement and instruction in God's Word. Until we meet again. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.